Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, gentlemen. Oh, good morning. It's been a, it's been a, uh, it's been a weekend. Well, we had a long weekend. We had we a July have, 4th weekend. We, yeah. And um, it feels like July 4th weekend lasted like 12 days. Do you, yeah, for, well, for you, you are, you are out. Yeah, but San Francisco <laughs> emptied out like last Friday. It was, was amazing. So amazing. Yeah. It was so quiet. You there was no traffic it. through the city for like the whole last week. Yeah. We, went, we went to the Presidio picnic yesterday, which is like a big, there's a million food trucks out on the Presidio Green mm -hmm. uh, near Tracy's restaurant. Oh, yeah. The in, the, in that quad yeah, triangle on, near the, the school. Next to the Walt Disney Family Museum uh -huh. and all that. And it's usually jam packed. And we rolled in in middle of the middle of the window and there was lots of space. There were kids running around playing soccer. It was really Lovely. Amazing, yeah. amazing. I went to Portland to Ooh. see my in-laws for the 4th, which was delightful. Portland turned out a gorgeous sunny day on the 4th. <laughs> um, and then I went and gave a talk on th uh, Friday night in Phoenix at Mensa's annual convention. Wow. Mm. Yes. And I sustained an injury on stage during my talk. Were you juggling? What, what, no. What, what, paper um, cut? No, uh, they specifically asked for a talk that was about the history of Mythbusters and some things that I, you know, stories that I wanted to tell about it. So I went through yeah. a bunch of old stuff I had. And way back after we had aired Water Slide Wipeout. Uh, Is that which the one where you went down the hill? The 220 foot the... slide and flew through yeah, the that air. That one looked really dangerous. It, and it was. And I actually have some really cool stories about it. But I also have in this talk all the raw footage of each oh. of my jumps. And it's, it's pretty stunning to watch. Yeah. And one of them made me laugh so hard, I backed up and doubled over and smashed my head into the lectern. Ooh. And that's what this little What's mark on my wound? forehead is. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right in the center. Yeah. 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 Nailed, nailed one in a million <laughs> shot, Adam. Good job. So I, I finished my talk, and people were clapping. And then I had another 30 minutes of Q&A to do. And that's when the uh, one of the organizers that had hired me came up to the foot of the stage and said, here is a napkin. You've cut yourself. I didn't even realize oh. I'd lacerated. So you're bleeding. I wasn't actively bleeding, because okay. I think that would be a little too gross yeah luckily it just looked like this on okay. stage oh, good. yeah i mean i think it you know it dialed up the commitment clearly yeah <laughs> you could go as vision for halloween and put oh, an infinity there stone right there right. Or, and, or just yeah. post removed vin i could do yes. with dead oh, vision that's a dark that would be, I, want, I want to see that wow that would be a good costume they're <laughs> all black gray. and white yeah just like oh. black grayed out contact i love the black and white costumes when people do oh that. yeah i i want to see i want to see the the 1930s Noir Spider Man. Oh, I'm sure yeah. that there were people like Anime Expos yeah, this the, weekend, yeah. I think. And it's I'm sure weekend. that yeah, right, there right. were people I'm sure that there are people wearing Nick yeah. Cage Nick style. Cage Noir Spider Man. There was a there was a lovely couple that came to Silicon Valley one year that was yes. dressed as a yeah. black and white photo and they were yes. fabulous. Yes. Uh random tangent, Adam Rogers, our friend at Wired, yeah. wrote a story about uh is Spider Man's costume red and blue or red and black? And what the origins of that are, and is it because that the in the printing back in the day, when um, Ditko and, and Stan Lee were doing the comic, that the color separations were not good enough to do the blue and made it was black. Oh, oh. And it's it's been debated debated huh. over the years. Interesting. Well, I mean, if, if there's anything that playing the Insomniac Spider-Man game last year taught me, it's that there are literally a hundred Spider-Man costumes yeah, Spider over the years. Um, and another tangent off of Spider-Man, um, just before the podcast aired, we watched Tom Holland do his mind-blowing lip sync of Rihanna's umbrella from Lip Sync Battle. Yeah. Yeah. It's on YouTube. It's that is, I know he is a trained dancer. He is, I did not know that, but now I believe it. Yeah, and I, I'm astounded by the level of talent and skill. But that is a a world beating performance for that show. It, it's not even that. Like on top of his performance, like the stage work there is astounding because they recreate the music video as I like as I remember the music video. I no, 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 and, it like ten years ago probably. And I was thinking about the crew, right? Because they yeah. have rain on stage. I have worked on stages where we made it rain, and it is a. It is never not a nightmare to make water rain on stage. Well, yeah, because you have like you have the water, but you also have thousands of, of lights, thousands of amps, of giant lights yeah, everywhere. It's a good yeah. way to electrocute a really expensive performer. It's, and so you make pools on stage, you recirculate, you make yeah, it's it's a pain oh. in the ass. Um, when I worked for George Court's Performance Works, we did an Ico and Coma show, and they're a Japanese uh, experimental dance company, and uh, I mean. It was crazy. It was all. It, it was like some sort of Batman fight sequence in terms of like how much Tim water Burton was Batman everywhere. Fight sequence, yeah. Well, yeah. It's like the Joel Schumacher Batman, right? Okay. Like where the villains always in some sort of amusement park terror palace. Yeah, that's what the set was like. Terror palace. <laughs> 
Um, so I, I have a Fourth of July. Qu- somebody who is who is known for kind of blowing things up on occasion. Yeah. Is Fourth of July something you look forward to, or is it just amateur hour for you? You don't want to. It's neither. It's okay. neither. Um, I, I, I am. Uh, I don't care for the fireworks on 4th of July because I have dogs. And yeah. 4th of July is the holiday in which my dogs freak out and stand above us in bed drooling with fear and terror. Yeah, especially the mission. Oh, especially the mission. Yeah. Uh, and one of the graces of the past couple of years is that both Maggie and Huxley have gone <laughs> largely deaf. Yeah, Chloe, Chloe is totally inured to fireworks at this point at, at age 13 it's radically improved their experience of the evening so yeah. we actually uh they were with a friend over fourth of july here okay. in san francisco while we were up in portland okay that's good was uh, it portland so, seen as active in terms of the extracurricular fireworks uh i don't know yeah. i i not not it didn't seem so but again i wasn't in the middle i was over in like us near lake oswego the mm. okay yeah i know in pacifica where you are well it's pacifica it's then like if atlas if there's Antonis. an atlas obscura entry for pacifica it will be the world's largest amateur fireworks display <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, they have signs they have signs up on the road for two or three weeks before fourth of july they're like hey look man illegal fireworks will get you a thousand dollars nobody cares it's a completely wow. toothless law there are people shooting like we went to we went to some neighbors block party well we went to we went to a really wholesome all-american picnic during yeah. the day where like this parks and rec department hey shout out to the pacifica parks and rec department because they do good work they had like sack races and tug of war and all that kind of stuff for egg the toss. kids yeah they didn't do an egg toss i was disappointed they don't do bat races anymore because apparently it's a really easy way to concuss your kids what's a, what's bat, a race? bat race you, uh, it's where you put your head on the baseball bat and spin around so you get dizzy in a novel way and then you try to run in a straight line. Whoever gets, you have to spin like ten times and then run and then pick something up and then run back and spin ten times. Why not just wear a helmet? Look, man, I don't, we can't. <laughs> it's a it's a small town. They can't afford helmets. They only had one sack this year. It was <laughs> really yeah, really. Um, Budget cuts. It's that yeah, it's, it's the it's the disappearing coastline like, is all their attention. Yeah, it's tough, man. Property taxes are down. <laughs> um, no, it was it was super fun. But they people are firing like two inch mortars out of aluminum tubes and PVC tubes. And it's like the kind of fireworks you see in most municipalities, just dudes in their backyards firing them off. I will tell you actually, yeah. So you're asking about my experience with explosives on the 4th of July. What gets me is the YouTube videos. Like I almost don't watch many of them. No, don't. Because I don't like watching people get hurt. Yeah. And the one that really, no one was injured when San. Was anyone injured when the San Diego fireworks show went off all at all at once? I don't think so. <laughs> do, you, is, do you remember that? Yeah, Early. that yeah, yeah. The, the computer fired they, everything uh, off. Well, the they set time, it right? to milliseconds instead of seconds. Oh, right. Which is, I mean, and that's like right up there with the Beagle, but uh, infinitely less expensive. But well, my co- so no one was injured. I don't think so. Okay, so that one I don't mind watching. But all I can think when I watch that is this is someone's worst day. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Whoever programmed that, there, there was some many people in that crew. I'm sure felt crappy about how that went because there's like fireworks companies. Uh, it costs tons of money to do this. These guys are real experts. They build their own computer programs and own launch systems. It's for super super custom. And when that happened, a whole team of people must have been like. Uh, and so I feel yeah. their stress and I can't enjoy that clip. On the other hand, they made what is arguably the most famous fireworks <laughs> display of all time. So I'm not sure know. that I, I'm not sure they're, ha- you know, it's like the, it's like the cannonball episode for me, right? It's like, I'm That's really true. glad no one was hurt, but it's not something I love to talk about. No. I'm happy to tell the story in order to tell the cautionary tale, but it's not like it's, it's still not funny. Well, you don't, you don't to me, you, you do, property, even minor property damage still is impactful to people in ways yeah. that you don't expect. Yeah. Even if nobody gets hurt, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, yeah. it's, it's still not a great thing. Exactly. So anyway, yeah, Fourth so of July was great. Fireworks have a standout moment on a piece of television that debuted this past weekend. Stranger Things season yes. three yes. dropped on July 4th, July 3rd, maybe. <laughs> uh, I've binged it all. Did, Did you? you guys see any of it? I haven't seen a single no. bit of it. Oh, I didn't watch season two because people were like, yeah, season two is not so good. Um, season two, I felt um, a little exhausted at, towards the beginning of season two. With There's an entire episode that seems to be devoted just to hop yelling at 11. And that, yeah. that tired me out dramatically. Okay. Later in season two with Sean Astin's character and Bob. also uh, the the the... 
sorry, I'm now. It's been so long since I watched season two. I'm blanking on all the names. But with Sean Astin's character and the adventures they all go through, yes. it's very Goonies. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, it's, I, season two okay. shapes up and is terrific. Okay, season and you three. could actually almost skip the whole episode where Hop and Eleven are yelling at yeah. each other. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it takes a while for them to bring her back into the fold. Yeah, season three is so much better. Oh good. Oh good. It is okay. so much better. Uh, I don't want to go into any spoilers, but where season two has a lot of you know pop culture references, not only with the music but the movies and mm-hmm. the times, mm-hmm. Ghostbusters being the thing that they really latch onto. Yeah. Season three, they double down. There are like some meta level, some characters who are clear homages to eighties oh, wow. film characters. Um, a new villain in uh, the mayor, played by played by Carrie Ellis. Uh, oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Princess yeah, yeah. Princess and Bride and, 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 and Yep, exactly. Lo- I'm so glad. I'm so glad that we'll get to see him. He yeah. was in Good. something recently. He popped up somewhere in not a way you would expect him. Well, he's in all the Saw movies, right? Oh, that's right. Oh, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> but he's the oh, perfect yeah. like, 80s actor to right. bring into right, a right. show to pay tribute like, to the 80s. Because you'd be like, like hey, Modine. it's that guy. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, what's he been in? Um, Hop is... The relationship between Hop and L is much better developed. Which kid is Hop? Is ca- no, no, Hop is the is uh, David Harbour. Oh, 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 yeah. Got it, got it. Um... I binged The Night Manager. I don't know what that is. The Night Manager was a John le Carré novel uh, about a former soldier turned night manager at a Cairo hotel who's ter- who's uh, turned by British uh, British uh, intelligence service to work against a gun runner. Oh. Um, and it's a terrific book. I read it many years ago. Uh, it is a series, six parts, six hours. Mm-hmm. That's the whole series. Um, Tom Holland is the night manager, and he's wonderful. Um, Hugh Laurie is the villain. Oh, that's, he plays I, a British gun-running yeah. villain. And, I mean, yeah. Tom yeah. Holland, meaning the Tom Holland, not of Spider-Man Tom sorry, Holland. Excuse Tom me. Hollander. No, nope. sorry, Tom Holland. It's not Tom Holland. I'm, 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 I'm Loki. Um, oh, Tom, oh, Tom, Tom Hiddleston. Hiddleston. Tom Hiddleston. I'm Hiddleston. getting my Toms mixed up. Yeah. Yes. Tom Hiddleston is Another the night manager. Look, they're all, in, all every Tom is in the Marvel universe now. So. <laughs> Did you the, the most perfect tweet? Are you talking about Ben, ben Acker? Acker's? Most perfect tweet oh, ever. Oh, I missed it. Okay, we're gonna get this wrong. Let me just look nope. it up so we don't mess it up. It's um, sorry. I don't want to make And Ben's we're head. talking about James Marsden. The is, most particular thing about James Marsden is he's the best. He's the only Chris named James. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's a really good tweet. <laughs> yeah. Well done, Ben. Uh, ben Acker's tweet of the week. Um, that we should do that. Uh, so anyway, the night manager was enjoyable. Okay. Uh, it was. I mean, there's some really good action in it. It takes place all over the world. There's some great villains. Um, I will say, I felt in the end, I didn't get the full, like, good guy defeats the bad guy in some mano a mano action movie delivery. I didn't get that catharsis. Mm -hmm. Um, It ends kind of the way you would expect it to end, um, yet it just lacked a tiny bit of catharsis to me. Okay. But um, it's what, what is it on? Is it on Netflix? Uh, I, Amazon? Amazon. I bought it on Amazon. Oh, and there's, yeah. There's, there's the the lead actress in this the the mall the girlfriend of the yeah. villain, um, the poor this poor actress is basically scantily clad in almost every scene. It's basically basically she's the phys- her costumes are the physical equivalent of side boob mm. for the entire oh. series, and I just kept thinking she's got to be cold, like well, no, it's Cairo, what? man. <sighs> He says Cairo. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, yeah, that was that was that's the downside. Um, anyway, so yeah, I watched that, but that was mostly about it. I've been reading. So my house has been taken over by Super Mario Maker Two this week. Is that a game? It is a video game. Okay, where you can make Mario levels, like old school oh. side scrolling Super Mario Brothers, Super and, Mario and, World, and this all is that. official. This is a real thing. Okay, they sell it. They sold one for the last Nintendo system, but this one's out on the Switch. <laughs> It's very good, and it is. You can upload your levels to the internet, then make your friends play them. Yeah, and you could be as horrible to your friends. Like the the thing that is, I've been playing with my daughter a lot. Yeah, yeah. because she's she loves platformers, Mario, and stuff like that. And it's fun to watch her make a level and figure out why it works or doesn't. Yeah. <clears throat> but the thing that happens is all of your bad friends who are adults and like to are either sadists or masochists they upload the levels that they create that are exercise yeah i don't know if you ever saw one of those old videos of like the rom hacked no. super mario brothers where like 
the guy had to make the exact perfect jump and make the one pixel to the other pixel right. and then jump off of the squid. And all. The, the one yeah. that I saw that I watched in its entirety and it's like 40 minutes long is the guy going through an impossible level and actually learning it because yeah. there's all these invisible coins and obstacles. Yeah. But he's doing it in this terrible Italian accent. <laughs> okay, Mario, we're going to do the level. Uh, oh, what the hell? And he gets madder oh, and madder. No. It is really side splitting really funny well so it, it is it is literally like five <laughs> games in one because there's like some people that just try to make levels that could be nintendo levels that right. are masterpieces yeah. they're yeah. brilliant right and then there's the sadists that make the one that wants to make you suffer and they want to they want ninety nine thousand people to play it and have six completions <laughs> there's no there's right? no requirement to let force you the maker of the level to have to beat it once yes, you yourself do. oh you do so the only way you can upload it to share <clears throat> is if you oh. beat it is if you beat it Oh, okay. so <laughs> that's that's a brilliant it's, convention. It's, it is yeah. it is a spectacular exercise in deconstructing something that that most of us are intimately familiar with. Because you know, I I don't know, I spent hundreds of hours playing Mario games, you know, through my entire life, probably right, thousands right, at right. this point. <clears throat> it's it's fascinating to get tools that let you build something that you're so familiar with and had very little conception of building. 20 years ago, 30, you know, I, I remember I used to draw Mario levels on graph paper when I was a wow. kid. Wow. Okay. Right? Like that was, a, that was, yeah. Things, yeah. But it was, so a, it's, yeah. the, it's, it is, it is a lovely, lovely exercise in making. There's some single player stuff in there. It don't, if you're not, like the single player stuff exists to show you what you can do with the editor, basically. Right, right, right. But the real meat of it is, is making levels and then jumping into the matchmaking thing and just, just playing stuff and seeing what what you like and what you don't like and that's awesome yeah it's a really neat it's a really like it is not a very nintendo piece of software and i'm really glad that they keep making these lovely yeah mm. hey adam you have to your left something that's been here the whole time this is a sword that's from the most recent episode of savage builds it is this I is I the meteorite sword that oh. um that we made at the crucible i i i helped to make this under the wonderful tutelage of jeff pringle master blacksmith um and the team over there at the crucible was incredible we spent uh over wow. a week there uh wow. and yeah this is this is my excalibur i have yet to make a scabbard for it or to finish the grip, but uh, this, these are future plans. I mean, this is also, it, it's Excalibur. So the two interesting things, one, the design of it, right? Mm -hmm. So you went through this book to pick out a 10th century design. Well, so the, the, the classic book is Oakshot's Book of Swords. And <clears throat> I don't know how you pronounce it, whether it's Oakshot or Oakshot, but Oakshot, uh, I, knew, I know about this book because I was told about it by Peter Lyon, Swordmaster at Weta. Um, and basically Oakshot developed the typology of swords types 10 through 16 I believe with all these subsets mm. um, and it's everything from the Roman Gladius to you know the last swords that were being made in the like 16th century 17th Cutlasses century so and yeah. yeah the whole thing um, and so yes uh, believing that the Arthurian legend comes about around the 12th century but supposedly happened way back when I chose a 10th, 11th century sword design because I figured that's what the 12th century people would have pictured in their heads as a ye olde sword. Yeah. Something about 100 years old. Right. Um, and I, I actually got some tweets about the the different versions of Mort d'Arthur um, and Excalibur is a very confusing subject, to be honest. There's Excalibur is the sword that the Lady in the Lake gives Arthur, but it's not clear whether it's the sword he's holding, that whether Uther Pendragon, it's not Uther, Yes, Uther Pendragon is carrying in the beginning of the legend. In some versions, it is, and in some that it isn't. And it's not the one from the stone at all, right? It is. The, oh, it is the, the one from the stone. Sometimes it's the one from the stone, and sometimes it's not. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, it's very confusing. Okay. Right. Uh, at any rate, I didn't worry about a lot of that. I yeah. simply chose this design, and this is the one we made. It's. It's. It, I love that it's made of sky metal. Yeah, it's space stone. Well, where where <laughs> else would they buy iron space in the stone. century, right? Exactly. Oh, and that's what gives it this pattern here? Yes. So the dark parts are the nickel transitions, and the, the lighter parts are the regular steel. Um, and we used meteorite that was uh, basically nickel and iron, which is a very common meteorite material. Uh, and it took freaking forever to cut through it, like 45 minutes like on the hour. band. It was like oh, a wow, really? Like, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, in Berkeley, you took it there. And, and that lets you see the composition of it. Exactly. And so you, you pour a little acid on there to bring out the, the her transitions. And this also had that same treatment. After tempering, we did a little acid wash to sort of bring out the details. It has one flaw up here towards the tip. You can actually feel there's a little 
There's a little flaw oh, there. Okay. Yeah, a little chunk. Yeah, a little, just a, a little void in the hammering. I, one of the things that Jeff Pringle said is when you're making a sword like this, at every, at every moment, you are one step away from total disaster. Of like breaking. He's, and... Yeah, he's made swords like this where you fold it and you think you've distributed the material correctly and then you temper it and it cracks in half. Ooh. Oh. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he has apparently dealt with that more than a few times. Were you prepared for that? I was, I okay. was. Uh, you know, I didn't want it to crack in half, but uh, he was, <laughs> he, he, he set my expectations to a proper level and said, right. you gotta be ready, this thing could just crap the bed. Luckily, it wow. did not. You also said on the episode that you were able to buy the meteorite online. Is that a difficult thing to do, to um, buy a meteorite? It's not that difficult. They are fairly common. They are expensive. Mm. Uh, we spent a fair bit on it uh, in order to find a chunk that would have as much material as we wanted. Is How's the eBay thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, they, they, they promise a composition. They say that it's yeah. going to be this yeah. heavy. I you mean, look at the size. A, like, there's okay. a lot of people out there hunting meteorites. Yeah. Um, we we actually we wanted to do the episode where we went out and hunted for them in fields because there are people ah. that have even gone so far as to make their own electromagnetic coils drag behind trucks to you know go through larger to cover larger swaths of of, of land um unfortunately it didn't work out that we had we didn't have the time to do that because yeah. the I really didn't realize how involved the forging process well, and, and the is. Episode, it's days and days and days and days. Like if you went out with trucks for two weeks and were dredging some field in Iceland or something, and then you didn't find the meteorite, it's not a great episode yeah, of TV, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not an expert. Well, then, then you call in the PA with the uh, the yeah. eBay box Look, and we found oh, this, this We one, found this perfect. eBay in the field. It's got the tag off on <laughs> yeah. camera. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. And then the... the um, the using of the sword was that was so much it looked so much fun it, you know i love getting uh i love the weird amounts of training that i get on the stuff that i do uh and that was really really fun i also uh i did some practice on that slicing off camera with my boromir sword which mm. was also super fun and it worked I yeah. Mean, oh yeah, yeah 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 it's a it's a stunning piece what, um what did you, i haven't watched the episode yet Oh, so we were slicing through tatami mats and oh, through gallons okay. of water and things like oh, awesome. that. Just running the sword through its paces. I was unable, I, I didn't learn well enough to be able to do uh, the, the deep level of slicing I was hoping to do, uh, simply because it's a it's really difficult art, but one I want to explore more because it's it's a real workout. Did you Let's um, get a bunch of two liter bottles? Yeah, them up exactly. With, yeah. With tinted water. Or uh, you know, get somebody to huck lemons at you. There we go. Well, yeah. That was we did that for free. I, didn't you? I remember that yeah. was so much fun. Yeah. Um, we also uh, AdamSavage.com Savage Industries released some new products this weekend on the Ooh. on the third. Um, we have a brand new EDC three hmm. beach tote. Ooh, yeah. Open top. Uh, open top. Um, Does it have uh, the frame to hold it open still? Or no, no, okay. no. It's just a big open top with four big pockets. It'll carry all the tools in your toolbox, but okay. it's also great for the beach, and it's got a beautiful colored interior. It's gorgeous. Oh, awesome. And we have some new pouches that we've released in a gray Dyneema. I believe that's the material they're, they're, they're being made in, um, and they're gorgeous. We've been selling a ton of those. And we have a bunch of new patches. We have some makeup patches, uh, eyeglasses. We have a, a pilot's bag. Uh, toiletries and a, and a few others. Cool. So we just sort of re-upped the the whole product line yeah, on reverse. adamsavage.com is where you can go see that and order them uh, through Shopify. That um, a parachute orange inside the toad is, dude, is beautiful. Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah. Norm yeah. Norm does all the photography. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Parachute orange. I I feel like that was one of the things that I loved about about Tom Sachs's work is his his appreciation for that bright orange that the, the nuclear the warning orange and it's, oh. it's not in enough places like. And Tom's orange is specifically, I believe, comes from two two places. One is off of um, New York Public Works Department barricades, which is this that um, right, yeah. uh, 3M Scotch light paint that they paint the orange parts with. And also uh, Air Maze boxes. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah, he got some hard Air Maze yeah. boxes to build other things. Of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> of course he does. Um, Next week, you're in D.C., Next week, I'm I in can't DC. believe that's it's next week is the yeah I leave the like anniversary. We're like a week 50th and a half. anniversary of Apollo. Have you been following the uh, uh the Apollo fiftieth? It is my Twitter feed? favorite Twitter right now, dude. It is so intense, like realizing how much these guys are training for hours and hours every single day, right up to the, the launch. La yeah, the very last minute, like the suiting up. Like a couple days ago, it was the suiting up 
the 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 suit the donning the suit trial and and practice and the egress tests and like it's amazing well and then because i've poured over so many thousands of photos of this entire period of time for so long i have mental images in my head of each one of these events that they're tweeting it's 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 so cool it's an amazing thing it's an amazing thing that we did it'll be really lovely to celebrate with with the nation from our nation's capital this uh, this next week so for people who don't know though because I'm sure there's a lot of people here who have no idea what we're talking about. You're going to D.C. I'm going to D.C. to ho- uh, to be participating in a couple of different uh, live stage events. Uh, re the 50th anniversary of Apollo. There's one on the mall on the 19th of Apollo 11. Specifically. Of, excuse me. Apollo 11. Yeah. Uh, and then there's one on the 20th at the Kennedy Center. There's also a dinner. There's also uh, Jen Schachter and I are going to be assembling Project Egress. 44 makerspaces contributed parts to this Um Microsoft's product division, Jimmy DeResta, uh, Kate Nevelin, and Bill Duran, all sorts of friends of ours from all across the world have been building parts for the last month for Project Egress, which is a, a, a multiple makerspace calico, exquisite corpse uh, assemblage of the escape hatch from the Apollo command capsule. And, and- all different parts, all individual parts, all individual parts, 44 separate parts, yeah. hinges, linkages, gearboxes, everything, each made by a different makerspace. And while they had to get the size exactly right, because we have whole patterns to match, they could make it out of any material and they could paint in any way that they wanted. First off, it's amazing because I know a lot of people are doing 3D printing stuff. I think Jimmy, I, uh, he posted stuff on Instagram stories about his process for his and he 3D printed it and then recreated the 3D print and materials that he's more com- more that he likes better. <laughs> um, and uh, like it. Yeah, it's 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 astounding that we've come so far in such a sh- in the last 10 years, because if you tried to do this and people were doing 3D printed stuff 10 years ago, oh, it never would have yeah. gone together. <laughs> um, and it show, it's a great demonstration. You're right. And in that, you're right that it's a great demonstration of the state of the art, of the number of different options and processes available to people. Um, we also made it really clear that this is... Uh, a super transparent build. So, so many of the makerspaces have not just been putting their build process up on Instagram and on Twitter, but they're also making YouTube videos of the build process and sharing. Uh, again, these files are open source. We can link to them below yep. this um, on the Smithsonian's website. There's already apparently a couple of people who've already made their own full size yeah. hatches from progress. our files yeah, or in progress. In progress. This is like my dream come true is to have one of these in the cave. Oh boy. Oh yeah. No, so, someday. <laughs> uh, Jen said that people are posting stuff on the Project Egress hashtag. So if you want to find it, you can go Thank search you. on Instagram, on YouTube, uh, presumably wherever people post kind of maker videos and and find the different builds as people are posting them this week and probably into next would be my guess. Uh, and by the way, I just want to, a shout out to Jen Schachter for the wonderful birth, first project management of Project Egress, which was no trivial thing. Oh my gosh. Uh, and she's been working on it for like at this point, like eight months. Yeah. Almost been, solid. Yeah. All yeah. different forms. Yeah. Um, and then also the name Project Egress, which oh. is also Jen's. And I, I love that name. It's very good. I, it, 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 because... <clears throat> We do these things to collaborate with people we know and people we don't know, but from all over to bring something together as a way of inspiring other people to collaborate, to share their work, to try things they haven't tried before. And so to me, it is always any one of these collaborative projects is about showing someone a door and opening it for them. And saying there's there's this whole universe through this door, and here's this perfect analogy of we're actually making a door. Well, <laughs> I, and like I want to, I think it's great that people are making their own sets, but I want to hear about like people that work in makerspaces or work in shared shops that everybody takes a component and does their own work and and d- does the same thing on a different different scale. Like yeah. it's, this is it's this is a fascinating kind of project. It today. is, and and the more you read into the creation of this hatch. <clears throat> The creation of this hatch is unfortunately came about because of the tragedy of Apollo 1. The three astronauts burned inside the capsule on the ground. Um, And it was an incredible engineering achievement done in a very accelerated amount of time for NASA, which, uh, you know, is very uh, change tracking, happy and difficult bureaucracy to implement a fast moving project like this. And yet they totally did. Uh, So the whole story of Project Egress 
grids onto this collaborative process and what this door opens up and what it what it represents in a way that I find really resonant and lovely. Well, the story of Hatches and NASA, there's probably been multiple books written about that between Gus Grissom's uh, uh, prematurely firing, uh, you know, uh, uh, explosive bolts <sighs> yeah. hatch yeah. that yeah. lost, what was it, Liberty 7, I guess? I, I can't think, remember. Yeah, they just found it. They found uh, it a few, few, years, few years ago. ago yeah. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, also, in uh, because I've been following a whole bunch of Twitter feeds devoted to Apollo and NASA and the celebration, um, I came across this, um, apparently at Johnson every now and then, they, they go out to a bunch of the manhole covers at Johnson oh. and rub screen printing ink on them and put t-shirts on and screen print t-shirts with NASA manhole, manhole covers? Covers, covers patterns on them. Oh my God, if I had known you could do that, we would have done that when we were at Johnson. <laughs> and they're so many different designs that are oh, wow. really really beautiful NASA worm logos yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah oh yeah it's it's really 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 cool uh Holly uh space girl yeah uh that's not a the... uh Astro no she's 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 she works she, she worked in mission control on ISS yes, and some yes. of the last let's missions. link to her Twitter feed okay. below this yep. um she's how I found that and like then went down this whole rabbit hole of t-shirt printing at NASA um, she's she is an awesome follow on Twitter. If you're interested in um, NASA stuff, both the official and the unofficial, um, she tweets behind the scenes stuff about the decision making process, which I find really fascinating. Um, I, I can't find her Twitter right uh, now. Yeah, we, we will, will link to it we'll under, under she, uh, we, the description. We have to. We should get her on the show next time. She's in absolutely. She's, she's, a, she's um, a very good podcast guest. Yeah. Totally. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, last two bits of shout outs. You brought to our attention that one of the last model shops in San Francisco. <sighs> The Hobby Company on 16th and on Geary, Geary is closing after 44 years. Uh, I was there yesterday buying some paint for a project today, and the owner was telling me about this. They're doing an earthquake retrofit on the building. Um, they are unsure whether they will be able to move back into the space. They're currently thinking about it, looking at a new retail space, but it's obviously difficult in one of the most expensive cities in the world. Yeah. Um, but this is literally the last hobby store in the county of San Francisco. We, think. we, we, we we're pretty yeah. sure. I mean, in, in traditional I mean, sense. Like, yes. It, that isn't like a big chain that has like. Well, obviously we have Blix things. and we have Flax. Yeah. Um, both well, Flax impossible to drive to. Well, Flax is in the Fort Mason. Fort Mason. Fort Mason. Oh, oh. I thought yeah. It Again, Bay. impossible to yeah. park at. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the same thing with Blix on Market, impossible to park yeah. at. So I, I have a hard time visiting both of those. Yeah, model making in terms of supporting, you know, small scale model makers. Well, and, and she and was saying she has to buy from dozens and dozens of different vendors just to keep stocked in models. Um, so I wanted to go over there this week and purchase a bunch of stock of their models. I would like to help them out. And also, I, look, it's a shout out to San Francisco people. If you somehow control a 1,500 square foot retail space that you'd like to rent to the, the last model stop in San Francisco, I know this is a long shot, but I'd really love to see it happen. We lost Franciscan Hobbies a few years ago. That was a tragedy. We still have that wonderful, weird train store in Berkeley on University at Cal, uh, which is terrific. There's but the electronics shop and train store in uh, San Rafael still, too. Yes, that place all is electronics. Great. Yeah. Um, and But... <sighs> This is this is the sad thing about about retail. It's really it's getting harder and harder and harder for traditional retail to be able to cover its expenses, especially when everything's available online by tomorrow. And yeah. this is, they're they're finding that's a, a real difficult uh, needle to thread. But at the same time, like one of the first things that Norm, one of the first challenges Norm and I had when we started tested almost ten years ago now was we were building the first MakerBot, the cupcake. Yeah. And I stripped the the EL wire that you used for the heating element because I didn't follow the instructions very well. <laughs> and it turns out when you strip that wire, it's not going to work super well. And we had to go find a piece of EL wire. And Cap there was, on tape. Uh, uh, yeah, Captain Tape too. But there wasn't yeah. any, but nobody sold one. No. Like the, there were no hobby shops that had that yeah. here. And it was something that would have been super common maybe 10 years before even. Totally, so, totally. Yeah. We don't have Radio Shack anymore. Um, what I'd love to see, I don't know if this is possible, but could there end up being a retail supply store for makerspace needs specifically that would sell things like vinyl sheet and filament and other support material? And Acrylic. the problem is there's so many hundreds of 3D printers. How do you support? Who do you choose? How do you choose? There are local support? places down in LA, like Matter Hackers does yeah. that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And they do, you know, those places survive by being both a location based and also being an online distributor. Right. So right. you have to be in both places at once. Well, but, but, and then there's also a, there's also a, I think that the, the case to be made is that there should be 
the equivalent of like a '90s era Kinkos. Because remember, if you if right. you think about '90s, when I was in college, if you I didn't have a printer, yeah. And anytime I needed a printer, I needed a, a specialized computer or a plotter or something. I could go to go to a Kinkos or the the equivalent, which was like the the print shop was yeah. the one. Yeah, there was a and bunch of them before could, Kinkos ate them all. Yeah, you could rent time on those computers and stuff yeah. like that. And it seems like there should be. I mean, it's kind of what Tech Shop tried to be. But it seems like there could be something like that for things like sewing machines, like the tools that I need twice a year and don't want to have in my house right. the other 363 days. Um, anyway. So uh, it, I'm very, it's very, it's sad. It's sad news to me that they're, that they're closing down in August. Um, I, I, uh, I really hope they're able to find a space and open up again because they fill a small but really important need. God, it was the only place you could buy small to medium rattle cans. Yes. So they're every, every month. Yeah. Well, yeah. and stuff like that's hard to <laughs> ship. You, yep. it's, you like, you can't. You can't get spray paint the next day because it's against the law to put it on airplanes or something. I don't know. <laughs> you have to get it by via ground. That's all I know. Exactly. So and I stopped by Heroes Club, by the way. Oh, on, so on what's Clement. Heroes Club? Heroes Club is a it's a boutique, uh, high end toy store that basically sells your six scale figures. Your oh, they've been there since I've been in San Francisco. They've been there. Since way since before 1990, it's when I moved 6th here, um, no, uh, Clement. Clement. Clement, Clement, and uh, like right eight, off Park Presidio, ninth? exactly. Oh, North oh of, wow, way out there. Okay. Yeah, uh, but basically, uh, the guy builds models and then sells them. Like, yeah. A lot of the stuff, like he's lovely work. Yeah, they do really lovely work. great work. Um, he used to have a great Bruce Lee shrine in the back. Oh, really? With, like, tons of Bruce Lee figures. It's always yeah. been a little disappointing to me. It's a very niche. It's yeah, yeah, very yeah. niche, yeah. and yeah. it's not necessarily my niche. So yeah. sometimes, like, but. You know, I did buy I did buy some of the first reference material for my Blade Runner blaster there back in the early '90s. Yeah. Have you guys done a kit bashing video? Oh yeah. I mean a yeah. couple, right? Yeah, yeah. we've but, done a couple. Yeah. But have you done? You, well, you did the one where you made the spaceship. Yeah. 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 And I, I mean, if you're going to go buy a bunch of model kits, that might be a good. I, mean, I don't think anybody would say no to more kit bashing. I, uh, you know what? It's definitely in the plans. Um, actually, my son thing too watched one of those and said to me a couple weeks ago, "Hey, I watched that kit bashing video last night. That was awesome." Yeah. It, <laughs> every time I've watched those, it looks super fun. It is. So. It is every bit as much fun as it looks. And yeah, we should do some more. Yeah, I totally absolutely. agree. Okay. Um, last bit of, uh, new episode of Savage Builds is this Friday. It is uh, the Nitro glycerin nitroglycerin oh my god so no explosions this week is what you're saying <laughs> this there are so many explosions and yet not all of them were predictable no Whoa. one was hurt during the making of this but nitroglycerin is the most terrifying material on earth really yeah we'll, that's all you need we'll to know leave before it at you that. watch the episode yeah. 10 p.m on discovery okay uh, friday night 10 p.m uh airing again the following week wednesday night at 10 p.m on the science channel you can watch it on either discovery go or science go uh online after the episodes aired it's on hulu too and youtube tv Yes. Um, and if you didn't see the meteorite episode, all of those are available still. You can watch them right now. Indeed. All righty. Uh, I think we'll try to do one more podcast before you head out to DC next yeah. week. Yeah, we'll get one out next Monday. Yeah. Okay. And what? go watch Spider-Man, guys. Yes, I'm, I got to go. I got to go, go. Yeah, later this week, if not this afternoon. I almost <laughs> went last night, but I didn't have the energy. Oh, yeah, I was the four-day weekend. Uh, I'm curious yeah, guys, yeah. to see your, hear what you think. Yeah, I'm excited. I Yeah, I love Tom Holland. Uh, I also love the fact that Jake Gyllenhaal got super into his costume. I heard, I read all about he's that. He's really into it. He's, he's a character. Oh, good. Yeah. Good, good, yeah. good. Okay. All right, thanks, okay, everybody. Bye, everybody. All right, bye. Bye, guys. 